Yes, in the back here. Hi, I'm Grace. I uh, work with the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. And I was wondering, as a tag along to that question, if you could speak about kind of the limits of physics for our grid infrastructure and if something like smart grid might really drastically improve um, the system in general. OK, so could smart grids make a, make a difference? Um, and what are the limits of, of physics? The, the efficiency of transmission grids is actually uh, pretty high. Um, so in the British grid, only about 8% of the electricity generated is lost in the transmission infrastructure. And most of that is lost in the local grid. The long distance grid um, loses only about uh, 1% of the energy. So energy loss isn't really the concern for, for grids, but the smart grid I do think has a, a crucial role. There's the question of matching supply to demand. At the moment we match supply to demand by having fossil fuel power stations switching on and off. Um, that's our main mechanism. If we could have a smart grid in which demand is controlled in a smart way, that could uh, lead to great savings in capital costs. Um, we would need fewer generating stations and they could just run flat out or at whatever rate they are naturally producing if we're talking about renewables. So I see the smart grid as a, as a really a crucial part of the 2050 vision. New pieces of demand that we're imagining might come along are electric vehicles and heat pumps for, for heating buildings that are not currently heated in that way. And both of those pieces of demand are not time critical at all. You don't care when your electric vehicle gets charged as long as it is ready to go at 8 in the morning. And you don't care when the heat is being pumped into your building either as long as you're, you're feeling comfortable. And so they, those are pieces of demand which are very large and that could be moved in time very easily. So I see that as one of the main roles for the smart grid. The other contribution a smart grid uh, will make is nothing to do with the laws of physics, but it's the, the laws of humanity, which is if the smart grid can somehow engage the user in understanding their meter readings and having more of a live feeling for what's going on day by day, then I think we could get massive behavior changes because it is very easy after you've used the DVD to switch off the DVD player. And if we can get people to make that behavior, change, then the, 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 the savings from that and computers and laser printers and so forth are really substantial. Yes, over here. Thanks. My name's Murray. I'm a postdoc in applied physics. And I was curious on your comments on the recent climate scandal in the UK and what that's done. Uh, the, I'm speaking about the email releases. Um, what that's done for this whole endeavor, and also if you have, if you can step out of your physicist shoes and maybe give us some uh, recommendations for what public policy can do to accelerate some of this change. Okay, uh, let's take the first um, question about climate. Some people say that there's been a scandal. I, I don't think scandal is the right adjective for what's happened. Someone stole some emails and then published them. And uh, a lot of mud is slung at these, these people uh, saying that they've done all sorts of bad things, but I don't actually see evidence for them manipulating data or anything like that. Nevertheless, that's what the mudslingers uh, have been saying, that there's been wrongdoing, and, and it's caused a lot of damage, and I think uh, mainly quite unfairly. And what I'd like to say about climate is uh, I'd like to reflect on uh, the way the science really uh, works. I think the public impression is that climate uh, science is all about looking at a graph of temperature versus time and arguing over the temperature versus time and coming up, up with some attribution of where did this uh, uh, temperature change come from, if you believe there has been a, a change, and is it getting colder during the last uh, two years or not? And, and I think that's a travesty of what the science community are, are actually up to. Um, the, the travesty says, oh, all they do is they look at this graph, then they look at this graph, which is the carbon dioxide concentrations for the last 1,000 years, and they say, oh, that went up too, therefore there's a link. But that's not what, what's actually going, if, going on. If it were like that, it would just be like the Pastafarian theory that says global temperatures have gone up and piracy has gone down, therefore we need more piracy. But the difference between the piracy theory of global warming and what real climate science is doing is that real climate science has got a mechanism. And the mechanism was recognized in 1827 and uh, measured in 1860. And there's still uncertainties about all the feedbacks in the system, um, but they also make predictions that are far more complicated than just referring to a single number. It isn't all about a single global number, the temperature of the planet. In 1975 already, 
computer models were made that modeled the Earth as um, a two-dimensional um, object with a height of an atmosphere and a latitude replicated around, around the axis. So this is showing latitude and height. And they made predictions not just of a single global warming, but how much warming do you get everywhere when you uh, look in different locations, uh, look at radiative transport, uh, transfer using uh, the, the known equations of physics with heat flowing in at the equator and out at the poles. And these computer models made detailed predictions, more than just one number. These are the predictions if carbon dioxide concentrations were doubled. And the predictions include details like you get warming in the troposphere near ground level, and you get cooling in the stratosphere. Plus, you get more warming at the poles than you get at medium latitudes. So the predictions are detailed, and they're testable, as long as humanity does the right thing and uh, carries on emitting carbon dioxide so we can see what happens. And humanity's been doing a reasonable job. We haven't doubled carbon dioxide concentrations yet, but they've gone up enough that you can actually measure what has happened. And remember what I said, tropospheric warming, stratospheric cooling, that's what the data is showing from many independent experiments. And the predictions made prediction uh, about temperature change at different latitudes as well. And here, uh, now in the 2000s, you can do predictions in color. And the predictions take into account uh, other effects in addition to greenhouse gases which dominate in the predictions. The, the computer models based on physics predict, again, warming in the troposphere, more warming at the poles, cooling upstairs. And you can actually make observations, not over the whole planet, because we don't have a sufficient observation network. But here on the bottom right are the observations actually measured uh, compared with the predictions of the latest computer models. And you can see the observations largely agree. There's warming at, um, uh, in the troposphere. The tropopause uh, has gone up a bit. And the cooling in the tropopause and uh, in the stratosphere uh, is occurring. Uh, of course, the predictions aren't perfect. There's a little hole here uh, uh, and a place where some cooling is happening near ground level. Goodness me, call the media quick. Uh, you know, predictions wrong, shock. Yes, the science still has uncertainties and these models are, are not perfect. But my feeling is the climate scientists are actually making detailed predictions and they're onto something. We have time for one more question. Right here in the middle, please. I am Carlos. I am a, a, in sabbatical semester here at Harvard. Um, I wanted to tell uh, first that uh, pirates are coming back <laughs> in Somalia, and, and the second thing is I wanted to ask if you will, if you are willing to uh, make a guess about what will actually be the future of energy. Okay. I'm being asked to make a guess for, about a future of energy, and I was asked earlier also to make policy recommendations. I, I think um, the policy recommendation I'd like to make, uh, which will perhaps answer um, your question about the future, is I would really like the public to engage in a numerate conversation about our energy options, putting all the options on the table at once, so demand side and supply side options. So. I've done a little bit of this in um, small groups uh, where we take little cards that represent in green what you could get from various renewables and you can slide the cards around to indicate how much you would get from renewables to match today's consumption. Then you're introduced to some red options which show today's consumption and you can make lifestyle change uh, and technology change assumptions about the red side. And then you can discuss how you would, as a group, like to agree with each other about what to do with your red stack and with your green stack. And by this sort of approach, I am hoping that humanity will choose a plan that adds up. And myself, I'd actually be content with any plan uh, that, that adds up and that uh, gets us off uh, fossil fuel. So I don't want to recommend a particular outcome. And in my job in the Department of Energy and Climate Change, we've been developing a calculator, a, 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 which could be a web-based uh, model, a spreadsheet, um, that allows you to make uh, choices on the demand side and on the supply side. So we have levels of action. Do you go for a, a, a lot of home insulation um, or not very much? Do you go for a hell of a lot of nuclear power corresponding to an Apollo mission's worth of nuclear power or none? What do you do about wind? Do you have an Apollo level of activity on wind 
or very little activity. And you can make all these different choices and then see what the outcomes are on the right-hand side in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Do we reach our target, which is for Britain, an 80% reduction on 1990 levels by 2050? And we can have other outputs of economic measures, security of supply measures, and so forth, land area. What does the view from your window look like as you make these choices over here? And do we have a plan that adds up? So I'm hoping that every country will be able to make these sort of calculators and have public engagement processes that help people actually understand the choices we need to make. So uh, remember, Christina Johnson will be here on April 13th. Please come and join us then. Enjoy what I hope will be a wonderful spring weekend, and please join me in thanking David again for joining us. Thank you very much.